we're going to be chatting a little bit about why a nine to five job no longer makes sense. And really the system as we know it um, is broken. And, and ultimately here's hopefully your, your escape plan. So um, once again, you know, if you haven't met me before, if this is the first one that you've been to, I think we've done like three or four of these now. Um, but my name is Kiko McCauley, CEO, founder of The Modern SDR, helping normal everyday people learn the skill set of remote sales and start making upwards of an extra five, 10, even $20,000 a month. Um, I think some of our students are even making, you know, 25, 30,000 um, and, and above now um, with this skill. And they're also able to gain, you know, financial and um, location and time freedom, right? This was me back in 2019. Um, I actually started like a, a social media marketing agency back in the day um, and did a lot of work, you know, on my computers. I literally went on Craigslist and I bought like five of these like old Dell computers to set up shop in my college dorm room. This was like my, uh, you know, my Michael Dell, like Steve Jobs kind of photo there. Um, and then, you know, fast forward, you know, two or three years, um, by age 22, was able to travel to 19 different countries. This is out in Dubai, um, on the sky pool, right. Racing supercars here. And it was, it was all because, um, of this one new social media loophole that I actually discovered, um, that allowed me to, to really start to start earning, you know, great income and be able to travel around the world. Right. Kind of throughout this whole process. Um, I also realized that in order for, me to make more money, right? Um, in order for me to provide more value to the marketplace, right? And ultimately, once again, not have to worry about getting paid for the hours that I'm putting in, but rather the or not the hours that I'm putting in, but rather the value that I was providing, I realized that I needed to have more leverage, right? I needed to have more leverage in my life um, and not depend on you know the 24 hours or really 16 hours that I had in a single day. Um, you know, maybe this is, and, and, and I like to compare these, these kind of two cars here, right. Um, you know, maybe it's, you know, a job where we're capped on income, um, you know, back in, uh, I was like 15. Um, I actually worked as a lifeguard at, at, at the local Jewish community center. Um, and I felt really capped on my income. You know, I was waking up at, you know, 5.00 AM would work for seven hours, kind of just sit on the lifeguard stand, um, maybe make like 10 bucks an hour. I think it was like something really small probably even less. Um, and then after taxes, right. I, I mean, most of that money gets kind of taken. So, um, that's kind of how I felt that like from, you know, age 15 up until, you know, age 18, age 19, um, when I started to learn this, this new skill, but all throughout, right. I felt like I was driving, you know, this really beat up Toyota Camry. Um, I actually used to have an old, like 1996 Honda Accord, 200,000 miles really beaten down. Um, but that's kind of how it felt right. Um, in that, in that job. Um, and then, you know, over time, right. When we develop this, I call it the, a three-step emotionless selling system. Um, but, but kind of the skill that I'm going to be talking about today, right. Ultimately I, I realized that there was no cap on my income anymore. Right. I, I wasn't, you know, paid on my time anymore, but rather my value. So I realized that, you know, what's, what's going to be more scalable, right? The amount of value that you can provide or the amount of hours that you can work in a day. Well, as we all know, right, there's only 24 hours in a day. So it's going to be very difficult to make more money, right? If you're getting paid for the hours that you're at a job. Like, I mean, that's, there's, there's really no way around it, right? Because there's only limited time. And if you don't work more hours, you can't make more, right? So in order to make more money, right? it's very clear that we need more leverage, right? And we need to be in a vehicle, you know, maybe like this Porsche, maybe it's like a Porsche 911 here. Um, we need to be in a vehicle that allows us to have infinite growth potential, right? And really like seriously has no cap on, on income, right? Now, just to give some proof so you guys know that, you know, this isn't just like some random BS, um, you know, back, uh, I think I was 21 at this time, maybe 20, yeah, it's 21. Um, but on, on this day, I made, you know, about $15,000 in, in one single day, right? And this was as a kid, still in college, you know, still taking classes. I was studying still like 30, 40 hours a week, right? Uh, I was actually doing decent in school too. Um, and it wasn't even like a ton of time that I was putting in, right? Um, but because of this skill that I'm going to be talking about today and kind of what we're going through, you know, I was able to bring in just over, you know, 15 grand in a day just by myself. Um, and then collectively, I think this is as of like last year. It's like an old screenshot, but 
Um, we've done, you know, close to three, yeah, just over like 3 million um, in the business now since, uh, and that was like before I turned um, age 23. So by age 23, you know, doing about 3 million um, in the business over, I think it was like over like a two year span. Um, and this was kind of routine, even back in, you know, late 2022, just getting, you know, these square payouts of, you know, five, six grand every you know day or two, right? Um, this was out in uh, the New York um, Edition Hotel. We had a beautiful, uh, this was with some of my buddies, you know, um, you know, drinking our espresso martinis and, and our, and our oysters and everything. Um, but, you know, that's just the flashy stuff, right? Today, guys, you know, in this training, I, I really want to go really in depth um, to show you and, and to hopefully make you realize that the old economy, right? The old economy where we're trading time for money that we once lived in, right? Where nine to five jobs are, are really prevalent. You know, everyone's getting paid for their time and not their value. This, this model and this economy is no longer feasible if you really want to build actual wealth, right? Growing your income is no longer or, or should be no longer, right? About working more hours, you know, working harder, you know, going, uh, you know, going to school for, you know, maybe, I, I mean, I think we go to school 20, uh, how many years, right? Like 18 years. And then sometimes I, I think I went to school for like, 20, 22 years, right? Um, and, and that's crazy. Maybe it was like 18. But um, but once again, right, like in this new value-based economy that we're living in, um, you know, where artificial intelligence is becoming ever more apparent, job layoffs are spiking, you know, corporations are in a race to get the cheapest cost for literally everything and anything while maximizing profits. You know, the only thing that really matters now is the value that you can provide to the marketplace. Right. And if, you're not, and if you're not making the money that you really want to make, well, it most likely comes down to the value that you're actually providing. So today I'm going to be showing you just one skill and, and giving you guys a lot more context on this that has allowed me to get paid for my value and not my time and also help me bring home just over, you know, half a million dollars profit at age 21 while just working, you know, three to four hours a day. Um, and that was while I was traveling to, I, I, think, I, I think there was like 19 different countries, um, stayed in hotels for like a hundred days out of the year. Um, and that was like a big travel fix then. But um, just to show you guys that once again, it's not about the time you're putting in, but if you're just really fucking good, you're going to make a lot of money. Right. Um, and what's even more important though, about all of, of, you know, my achievements there, right. I was literally just showing you guys that hopefully, so you can get some context on, on who I am. If, if you haven't been to one of these webinars before, but what's even more important, though, is that this same skill, what we're going to be talking about today, paired up in the new value-based economy, has allowed people just like Andrea here, right? Um, this is him and his beautiful wife. It allowed Andrea to literally leave his nine-to-five job, have his dream honeymoon, right, with his beautiful wife, um, and now really finally be able to travel the world while making upwards of $15,000 per month every single month. Um, this was, you know, a Stripe screenshot right here. I think he made like 30 grand in, you know, just a few days. Um, Jason was able to match his monthly salary, you know, at Amazon in just one week. Um, brought home, looks like about 1600 bucks. Ashala here, right, actually got placed on um, a sales role and, you know, was able to start crushing it. Amanda got a base rate increase, increasing her commissions. You know, Steve, once he learned this skill, literally closing $100,000 deals in solar, right? Frederick here you know, made $3,250 in, you know, just three days. Um, here's some of the business owners we work with, right? Doing 182,000 in a month. Sean made 90,000 in a day. Eva here, you know, making consistently, you know, three to 7K of, of commissions here, right? And like the, like the craziest part too, is that this just kind of continues, right? Jason's over here, Leo, um, you know, Jim's here as well. Matt, absolutely crushing it. Um, you know, Mays, Jake, you know, Severe, Shad, right? All of these people, um, and, and hopefully, you know, maybe some of you guys too, um, as well as our 766 plus students here, right? I think we just surpassed like 820 students now, um, but it's crazy, right? So I hope you guys are prepared, um, but just drop a yes if you guys are excited to see how we could potentially you know, start getting results um, like this. Just drop a yes in the chat um, and we can uh, hop right in. Are we excited for this? 
Are we cool? Sydney is ready. Yes, sir. Teresa is ready. Remus is ready. If we don't have like four exclamation marks, guys, like, come on, what are we doing? Yep. Keegan's ready. Ryan Ward said he, he also worked in the Jewish community center. That's crazy, bro. John Ray Demirez is ready. Cool guys. Let's make some fucking money. So also if you guys, um, if you see on the chat, it says like to hosts and panelists, if you make sure that's to everyone, then we can just make sure that, that everyone's seeing all the messages and stuff. Cause I know sometimes, um, you know, I think it just goes to the hosts. Um, so yeah, just make sure that, that you're, when you're commenting in the chat, it goes to everyone, but, um, cool guys. So I think, you know, the biggest place to start is to really understand about the financial state of America. Right. Um, and a lot of this stuff is going to apply to other countries. I know we got people from all over here, but you know, right now, and this is a really scary statistic, right? But right now, more than 60% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck, right? As of September 2023, according to a lending club report, right? And this shows that like even people in higher income brackets are affected, right? More than half of Americans earning over $100,000 a year live paycheck to paycheck, right? Which is absolutely crazy. Um, and, and the scariest thing is that, you know, the average salary is, you know, half of that, right? So even people still making over $100,000 a year, it is so difficult to get out of this, you know, paycheck to paycheck um, lifestyle. And, and in order to make a change, right, it like the, the same sis, like we can't be doing the same thing over and over expecting for a different result, right? There has to be some sort of change, right? And if that wasn't scarier enough, um, you know, right here, like this is just going over, you know, income tax, but, you know, after all the money you make, let's say you take home, and I think we're going to use this example here, right? $53,000 a year. Um, you know, the, the scariest thing is that the government takes 21.6% of your money, right? I pulled this up on an income tax calculator. If you're living out in New York, you know, this might be a little bit different depending on where, where you're from, but you know, after plugging in $53,490, which is the average salary in America, right? We're only actually left with about $41,932, right? So let's break this down, right? Net pay left after $41,932, right? So the government takes $11,558 from you from the get-go, right? And this is as a W-2 employee. Then let's plug in rent, right? Well, the average national rent price in the United States, I'm not sure how much you guys all pay for rent, but um, if we don't own our house or maybe even a mortgage payment, right? After $1,300 of rent, right, times 12 months, that's $16,000 that goes for rent. Right. So 41,000 minus 16,000 is about $25,000 left. Right. So then let's factor in groceries. Right. This is if we don't eat out. This is just if we, you know, actually go and then go to groceries. You know, gobankingrates.com says on average, you know, groceries cost around 250 to 500 bucks a month. Right. Um, so I kind of average this out, you know, 400 bucks a person. You know, that's, that's really like $13 a day that you're spending on groceries. So, um, but that's about 4,800 over the year. So after that, right, we're really only left with $20,000. Now let's check out car payments, right? Mm -hmm. Car payments here, um, $726 is for new vehicles. $533 is for used ones, right? But how much money are we actually left with? Well, we're left with about $13,000 here after everything's said and done, right? And then we have healthcare. Um, average health, uh, average annual health insurance premiums in 2023, you know, were $8,435 for single coverage, right? Or 23,000 for family coverage, right? So net pay left from that, right? We already spent seven, you know, $7,200 on the car, right? Which is nuts. Um, and then also we have our average cost here of health insurance, right? So now we're only left with $5,000. And this was without incorporating gifts, vacations, going to see a movie, you know, hanging out with friends, like going out like at all, right? Which is crazy. I think I think we went out last night um, to, to like one bar and it was like $80 for like two people. It's like ridiculous, right? So, you know, if, if one night out is $80 and you want to go out like 10 nights in a year, it's another $1,000, right? And if you only have $5,000 left, I mean, it's pretty difficult to like do anything, right? Um, then let's say like Christmas gifts, right? Um, you know, $654. Like, I, I mean, that sounds pretty high in my opinion, but, um, that's like the average from, from, you know, CNBC, right. Or, or WCNC right here. 
Um, so now we're left with, you know, $4,000, right? And then let's factor in vacations, right? Let's factor in vacations. Um, you know, vacations, average vacation for one person in the U.S. costs about $1,900 a week, right? So that's it. only if you go on one vacation, right? If you go on one vacation for one week every year, right? Still $1,900, right? Which is crazy. So after all this, right? After groceries, after rent, after car payment, after healthcare, after gifts, after vacations, we're only left with $2,460, right? And this doesn't even account for any additional emergency expenses, repairs, eating out, doing anything fun on the weekends, going to movies or doing anything else, right? So this shows you that the system as we know it is broken, right? And, and after seeing those statistics, like who would agree that the system's broken? Like that's pretty fucked, right? Like, would you guys agree that the system's broken, right? Just, just comment a yes in the chat if you guys do. And, and yeah, let's, let's see, let's see what we got. Oh, yeah, it was terrible, right? Teresa, Ryan, broken. So we just concluded that the average American is left with $2,000 after everything that like we just went through, right? And that's not even accounting for additional emergency expenses, repairs, eating out, doing anything fun, right? And all our lives, we have been told, go to school, get a degree, get a master's degree, you know, buy a house, get married, work for 40 years, retire with a 401k, right? And honestly, on the surface, right, I think a lot of this stuff's actually, like, important, right? Like, I graduated from, you know, a great school, went to Vanderbilt University. Um, we are on financial aid, right? I, I sometimes even consider going back to business school, right? But like, once again, the whole narrative is, hey, you go to school, but then you work a job for 40 years, right? You you get into a bunch of debt with buying a house, then you have to get married and you spend a bunch on the wedding, you know, you drop all this money and then you work for 40 years, you know, you, you don't make enough money and then you try to retire with a 401k if you're lucky, right? And on the surface, this seems like a pretty safe narrative, right? Most people have probably been told, hey, do this and everything's gonna be okay. But when COVID hit, right, and maybe maybe you guys can relate because like it was actually scary coming out of college and seeing that most of my friends couldn't even land jobs. I think Vanderbilt's like seventy thousand dollars a year. Uh, One sec, I think our mics got switched. Um, can you guys hear me? Okay, I guess just comment a yes. If yeah, I think we should be good. Um, but, you know, kind of as I was saying, you know, a lot of my friends, I mean, that, that may have put, you know, $70,000 into the education per year, right? 280,000. And they're coming out of Vanderbilt and they're working at Starbucks, right? Like they, they couldn't land jobs, right? Like if, if the school system guaranteed a job, after that, hey, you're going to make $100,000 a year or whatever it is, right? I think that actually could be a feasible system. But the reality is, is that a lot of people are going through school. They, they go through all this stuff. They, they go in a bunch of debt, right? And, and I was really lucky to not have debt because of financial aid. But like, the, like it, it's scary, right? And then when COVID hit, right, job layoffs started happening in the hundreds of millions, right? AI is supposed, like, expected to replace over 300 million jobs. And, you know, 12 year old kids literally started making millions from the internet. I started to notice that there was a new tidal wave of change that was coming, right? From the old economy that we were in into the brand new value-based economy, right? I, I noticed that this new tidal wave of change was coming, right? Kylie Jenner became a billionaire. And I think this, I, I actually don't know if she like actually became a billionaire. I think, I think it was like 900 million. But we'll just say for for sake of this that she became a billionaire, right? Right. The Rock sold his tequila brand for like three hundred million dollars. There was you know multiple ten you know eleven year old kids making twenty nine million dollars in one year, right? OnlyFans girls you know making three four million dollars in a month, right? And the question really became, I mean, what did all these people have in common, right? Like like what what do all these people have in common? 
And it was two things, right? What did all these people have? What did Kylie Jenner have? What, what did The Rock have? Right? What did this 11-year-old kid with like 30 million subscribers on, on YouTube have that allowed him to make $29 million? And it was two things, right? It was a digital product to sell or, or some sort of product, right? The, the Jenners and the Kardashians have all their different brands and tons of attention, right? The Rock, right? has like mil hundreds of millions of followers on Instagram, right? And, and you know, just in all these different movies, right? This 11-year-old kid with 30 million subs, I mean, he's making about a million dollars per million subscribers, right? And what do these OnlyFans girls have, right? Or even OnlyFans guys, they just have a ton of attention and they're selling sex, right? So what do all these people have? They have both attention and a digital product, right? Every single wealthy person in today's value-based economy has either figured out how to sell, right? They've either figured out how to sell something or how to gain attention from millions, if not billions of people, right? Because with attention comes money, right? And the more attention you have, the more money you have at your fingertips, right? And it doesn't matter their age, right? Like we have 11 year old kids doing this, right? We have 55 year olds doing this, right? It doesn't matter your college degree level, right? This kid, 11 years old, right? Probably dropped out of elementary school, you know? And, and it doesn't even matter how smart you are, right? What only matters is that is, is the distance, right? And how close you are to the money. Like the reality is that the closer you are to the money, the more that you will make. It's simple as that, right? What Kylie Jenner, Karina Kampf, you know, The Rock, this 11-year-old kid, right, with 30 million subs, all they did is that they found a way to capture attention and then to monetize off of it, right? So the question now becomes, how can you guys leverage the audiences of these already wealthy and famous people and get close to the money as well, right? So if you guys want to see that, just, just drop a, a, a yes in the chat, right? I see Jake Williams, you raised your hand. If, if you have a question, you can ask that in the chat. But if you guys want to see exactly how we can get close to the money as well, then drop a yes in the chat. And I'm going to be showing you guys, right? So we don't have these 11-year-old kids capitalizing and, and we're not able to do it as well, right? Awesome. So... In order to get paid for your value and not your time, you must find a way to go straight to the money, right? And I like calling this straight to the money because the closer we can get to you know, these people with attention, the more money we can make, right? And how can you actually start leveraging these people's audiences and their attention as demonstrated above? Well, all in all, you must become irreplaceable, right? That's like number one of the thing, right? You know, like I, I think we just fired, um, like at, at, at our company, we just fired a bunch of like video editors um, because we have AI to like do all of it now, right? So like we've we've cut our costs a lot. And at the end of the day, all corporations are gonna do that, right? So you have to find a skill that makes you irreplaceable in a world where artificial intelligence is only, you know, growing. Job layoffs are ever more apparent, right? I think McDonald's, they just rolled out this whole like artificial intelligence robot system where the robots are doing all of the, they make the food, they deliver the food, right? And they do it faster than humans ever could, right? So if I'm the owner of McDonald's, right? Or any McDonald's franchise, why would I not want that, right? So in order to be able to, you know, not only go straight to the money, but stay as close to the money as possible, you have to become irreplaceable, right? Your ability to scale your income and sustain this income, right? Which I'd say is even more important. I think sustaining the income is, is the most important thing. It depends on how focused and disciplined you are at getting close to the money and staying close to the money, right? Because the closer you are, the more you make. And in this training, I'm going to be walking you through a simple three-step process that will allow you to go straight to the money and give you financial confidence, right? This is the most important thing, giving you the financial confidence and leverage so that in any economy or situation, you will always have a way to provide income for yourself and your family, right? Jas, that is funny. I like it. I, I, I actually really like that. 
I'm going to start a site teaching women how to cook. I'm going to call it OnlyPans. I think that's hilarious. Um, but that's what we're going to be talking about today, guys. And this same three-step process is the same process that allowed me to go from, you know, making zero to 1K a month, right? And it took me about 12 months to do that. And then go to 5K a month, right? Three months later, then start making $10,000 a month in 45 days, and then go to $20,000 a month in three months after that, right? And you see, it took a long time to hit that first $1,000 a month. But after that, it was only up, right? And ultimately, how to start traveling to beautiful places like, you know, Dubai, right? This is out in in San Diego with a bunch of our entrepreneurship friends. There's my girlfriend out there. I'm here. Luke's one of my mentors, a bunch of other people, awesome people. Um, this was me and my girlfriend out, out in Aruba. Um, that was, you know, our, our second date. We, we flew out to Aruba, went, went out here. Um, this is driving supercars. These are rented um, out in Dubai. That was really fun. Um, you know, and, and going to places like Greece, right? This same three-step process is exactly, you know, what allowed you know, me to start doing this, right? Now, before we get started, um, because this is like more of like the, the, the meat and potatoes kind of jumping into this, but um, I do have a few requests. Um, if you guys just turn off all electronics, you know, use airplane mode, close other tabs when joining in here today, um, you know, on the webinar or watching the recording, there's just gonna be a ton of value and the, that you don't wanna, you know, miss this. Um, and, and I truly believe that this webinar will have the potential to change lives, right? Including, you know, yours. Um, it took a lot of time to put, you know, this together. Um, but I do need help creating more awareness for others to find it so we can also help impact them. Um, so if you guys want, um, and, and this is much appreciated, just take a picture of this moment, you know, post it on your socials. Um, Instagram is generally the best and you can just tag me at Kikoa Mac. I know a lot of you guys are probably, you know, coming in from Instagram. Um, and everyone who does this will actually be, be receiving a gift. So if you do that, um, we'll make sure to repost you guys over on social media, and we'll also send you a gift to your uh, to your DMs. Now, um, this is for you, right? Uh, this this training, um, and and you're gonna want to stick around here live. This training is for you if you feel like you're working a nine to five job and you don't feel like you're getting paid what you're worth, right? Maybe you're already in sales, but you're not making the commissions that you want to make. You know, maybe you're running a business, but you're overwhelmed with the 20 to 30 different skill sets you have to learn, right? Maybe you're starting to feel the impact of inflation, right? And rising bills every year, right? Maybe you lack the proper environment, friends, family, relationships, right? Needed to really become the person of value that you want to become. And you feel like you maybe can't provide for your loved ones and your family and ultimately could be doing more with your life. So if that sounds like you, then this training um, is, is going to be hopefully really, really insightful for you guys. Now, how did it feel being stuck making, you know, zero, zero, like zero K, like literally zero dollars to making even $5,000 a month, right? Well, if you're in the same position as I was in, in 2018, you probably feel the following emotions, right? And, and made the following realizations. You might have achieved the big goal of doing what society told you to do, but you still feel like, right? that there's something missing. Maybe you feel like, you know, there's more to your potential and therefore end up feeling dissatisfied. Maybe you feel overwhelmed with the amount of work that it takes to generate money. And you feel like you're on the same hamster wheel as I felt I was either inside a business that isn't working, right. Or in your nine to five job, or maybe, you know, and, and, and seeing these 11 year old kids, like kind of pissed me off, you know, making $30 million a year, just posting these videos but I realized that I, I can't be mad, right? I have to accept, right? I have to accept that this is the economy we live in now and I have to, you know, make a change, right? So if you're looking around and you're seeing these influencers, you know, these other social media kids, literally just working less than you, traveling the world, literally making your yearly salary in like, you know, just a few days or even in, in a few months and you feel like it isn't fair, then th this training is going to be really helpful. Um, and also maybe you feel financially free, right? Maybe you, you feel financially free, right? Maybe you are making $200,000 a year, but at the same time, you still feel like a slave to your job, right? Because you have to work 70 to 80 hours a week and you have no time to actually ever see your friends or family. A lot of my acquaintances in college, right? I think consulting probably teaches you a lot, but one of my best friends, you know, was in consulting, absolutely hated it right? Absolutely hated it. Was working 70 to 80 hours a week, 
you know, thought it was the worst. Um, and he, he was making good money coming out of college, 20, 22 year old, 23 year old, making, you know, 120 racks a year, right? You can have a pretty fun life. But at the end of the day, if you have no time to actually ever see your family or friends, like, is it worth it? Right. And, you know, remember when, when, you know, I told you guys, Hey, we're traveling, doing all this stuff. I mean, this is working, you know, maybe four to five hours some days. Some, I mean, some days, like I, I just love to work. Right. So some days maybe I'll work 14 hours, but then other days it's like, Hey, let's go travel, you know, on a, on a Tuesday, let's go meet some camels in Dubai. Right. So if you feel financially free, but at the same time, still a slave to your job, with no time to actually ever see your friends or family, then this is also going to be helpful. And really to get out of this situation, right? You only need more of one thing. Like uh, it's really simple. You just need more leverage. Getting paid for your time and not your value will only lead you to having more headaches, less money in your bank account, and the feeling that you're not getting what you're worth. And what you'll find here is that more leverage, right? The only way to actually gain more leverage comes with the learning and internalization of more skills. We must have more higher value skills in order to actually gain more leverage, right? And this isn't any just specific skills. This isn't, oh yeah, I, I know history now, you know, oh, I, I, I went to English class and I can write an essay. No, right? This is not just any skills, but specific straight to the money skills that allow you to tap into other people's followers and businesses to make money, right? And the three-step emotionless selling system that I'll be chatting with you guys here today increases the amount of leverage that you have access to in your life. And if you're smart, right? If you guys are smart here, I assume all of you guys are incredibly smart because, because you even showed up today. So that's awesome. But, but if you're smart, you've probably realized that by now, working harder is not going to make you more money, right? Can, can we all agree that it's not about hard work anymore, but the amount of leverage that we have? Just drop a yes in the chat if you guys agree that in order to make more money, it's not about hard work, but having more leverage. Like, I, I just want to make sure that that's at least like the key takeaway from this. Cool. Carl F agrees. Teresa agrees. Cool. And in fact, right, it will probably just lead you to getting taken advantage of and it, or like on a race to the bottom, because at the end of the day, what do corporations want? They want to cut their costs as much as possible, right? And, and most likely they're looking at you, at, at you like a number. So once again, we have to make a change, right? So today I'm going to be breaking down how this three-step emotionless selling system helped me go from a broke college student to making upwards of $15,000 in a single day. Now, Let's take a look at your current job. And, and I would love to hear what everyone's jobs are, or I guess if you guys are, you know, I, I think someone said they were doing an e-commerce business, but let's take a look at, you know, all the jobs and, and see how we can start making more money, you know, within the, even the next seven days. Just if, if you comment that in the chat. Um, and once again, like, I think a lot of jobs are awesome because you can, you know, learn things and you can, you know, keep expanding your knowledge. But if you're not growing in your job anymore, if you feel capped, then in my head, it doesn't make sense to stay stuck, right? It doesn't make sense to stay in the same, same situation, but, um, and uh, unless you enjoy it, right? Like if you enjoy it by all means. Um, but like I was at the, the Jewish community center as a lifeguard, I fucking hated it. Right. So, so yeah. So, okay. Surgery doctor. That's awesome. Insurance broker for Medicare. I mean, that's really cool. Right. You know, um, substitute ESL is, uh, John, is that, is that sign language? I mean, that's, that's awesome, right? Like have an impact, um, technical support, retail, Paul is unemployed server. Cool. Now, how many of you guys actually enjoy your job? Cause, cause if you enjoy your job, I think that's awesome. Like, honestly, like, so, so drop a yes. If, if you enjoy your job or if you don't, I I'm also curious why, why we don't enjoy our job. Cause I, I think if we enjoy it. Then that's awesome. Right. Okay. So, okay. So Remus enjoys it. John enjoys it. Sydney enjoys it. Now for those of us that enjoy the jobs, right. Do we feel like it would be helpful if we earned like more money though? Right. Carl says, you know, not me too much micromanagement going on. Charles says, yes. 
Gotcha. So, so we all can agree that maybe the jobs are cool, right? But, but we still want to make more money, right? So today, right. And Sydney, totally agree with you. Like, I think, you know, if the jobs were able to keep up with the economy, right, then it would be worth it. But if the average amount that we're making only increases 3% a year, but inflation rises to 7% and the housing market, you know, keeps going up 10, 20%, then I also think it's very difficult to fill that gap if we don't find a way to make more money, right? So, so that's the biggest thing that, that I wanted to, to talk about today, right? So in this, you know, training, hopefully you guys will start to understand that it's not about how hard you row, but rather the boat that you're actually in, right? And this three-step emotionless selling system, you know, solves the three main constraints of a nine to five job to actually build real income, right? And that's what I'm going to be chatting with you guys about here today. And once again, you know, this isn't um, like, this isn't talking, you know, poorly about any jobs. Like, you know, I think there's a ton of jobs and if we enjoy them, that's awesome. But hopefully you can see that, you know, still, if you want to make more money, well, there still has to be some sort of change, right? So let's take a look at Jay Abraham, who has been known to be called the $21.7 billion man. And Jay Abraham here says that there's, you know, three main profit activators that are needed to actually start getting paid for your value and not your time, right? And the first here is getting more customers, right? So in order to make more money, we have to get customers, right? And it's either through starting a business or doing something like sales. There's only two things in this world, two things that have unlimited earning potential. And that's being in sales, right? Because your value doesn't depend, right, on how much time, but it depends on how much money you actually bring into a company. And then as a business, right? I mean, being in a business is obviously going to make you the most money, but it's going to be the hardest. And as a beginner, there's like 30 different skill sets you have to learn, right? So it's also going to be way more complicated to do that. So hopefully, as, as Sydney Bell is saying, right, we're going to be able to show you why once you learn this system, there's not going to be a glass ceiling anymore, right? So in order to get paid for your value, not your time, you have to be able to get more customers, right? So that's step number one. Step number two is that you have to do repeat business with these same customers. And step number three is to sell high ticket products to increase revenue. Because let's say, for example, we're selling $7 products. Well, how many $7 products do we have to sell to make $10,000 a month? A fucking lot, right? We have to sell a fucking lot of $7 products, right? And I'm not really good at the math here, but I think it's over, you know, that's over a thousand, right? Right. It's like, it's like 1300, it's 12,000, 1200, right? So we have to be able to sell high ticket products, to increase revenue. So we have our nine to five job, right? So we're not getting more customers because we're just getting paid for our time. We do repeat business with the same customers, Right sell high ticket products to increase revenue. And, you know, generally you have to be in the office, right? I think someone was saying that we have to go to the hospital all the time, right? I, I think that's what Remus was saying, right? So that's that's what a, a, a job would be. Now let's take a look at real estate flipping, right? In real estate flipping, we can get more customers, right? And that's, that's a really solid thing. Um, however, we're not really gonna do repeat business with those same customers. Um, you know, real estate properties are pretty expensive, so we get to increase revenue, but um, we're, not, we're not really going to be location independent either, right? Because still, even if you can do all three of these things, if you have to be there, right, it's going to be really tough. So that's like kind of the, the second thing there, right? Now, brick and mortar business, right? Maybe we get more customers, that's great, do repeat business, but we're also selling high ticket products to increase revenue. Um, and, and we're not doing that, right? Because we're in person, probably selling very low, inexpensive products. And then location independent, right? It's a brick and mortar business. We're literally in person. So that's kind of what that looks like. Now, what does it look like with, you know, e-commerce, Shopify, dropshipping? Because that's another, you know, big thing that a lot of people talk about. Get more customers, you know, do repeat business with those same customers, sell high ticket products, to increase revenue. Um, but, you know, we're not selling high ticket because a lot of these e-commerce products, maybe they're little trinkets, you know, $7 trinkets. It's still going to be hard to, you know, make a lot of money with that. 
right? Um, and then location independency, right? We, we do have that, but at the end of the day, it's going to be hard to scale because we don't have high, high ticket products. Now, what does a three-step emotionless selling system have? Well, we have, we're able to get more customers. We're able to do repeat business with those same customers. And we're able to sell high ticket products, right? $5,000 and, and beyond. And it's location independent. So we can be anywhere, travel the world, do the things that we want. So it's very clear, right? That the traditional nine to five provides you with the least amount of leverage, right? And maybe it's fun, maybe it's enjoyable. I think it's awesome, right? But really like, do we have enough money to thrive and prosper? You know, that's the real question that comes down to. And, and the other question is, hey, do we really wanna work in the same job for the next 40 years, right? And at like at the end of the day, you know, coming out of college, I I never even went the I I, I never went the normal route, right? Um, I I thought that hey, going into this consulting job, working for seventy to eighty hours a week would lead me just you know really unhappy, you know, also, you know, making a hundred thousand dollars a year wasn't really that attractive, um, because in college I I made fifteen k in a day, right? So like once that happened, I was like, yeah, there's no way I'm ever going to do a normal job, right? So how can people like us, you and I, really build wealth in 2024? Well, there's only really two ways to make almost unlimited income where you're paid based on your value and not your time, right? Which is either an online business, which requires 20 to 30 skills, tons of startup capital, takes four to five years, sometimes maybe even more and has a huge likelihood of failure. That's the first option. Or something like sales, which allows you to go straight to the money. Shout out Jas there, um, who, who, who was talking about this. Or something like sales, which allows you to go straight to the money where you just need to master one skill. And once you make the sale, your job is done. So you don't have to worry about fulfillment, customer service, all these other you know headaches of running a business. And these are the only two ways, truly, right? It's either, hey, start a business, learn all these skills, probably spend a ton of money, takes a ton of time, right? Or sales. And this new three-step emotionless selling system has allowed me to have a simple three-step process that I know that I can follow every time and know based on the data and the math, how much money that I will make each month. So I'm about to go through how to know your money-making math, right? But who would like to see that? Um, I just want to make sure we're, we're all following along, but who would like to see the money-making mass so we can actually start earning income with this skill set? Now, now that we know that, you know, hey, we have to have more leverage, right? Who wants to see the math for this? So Carliff does, Cindy, Charles, Carl, Keegan, sweet. So once again, um, you know, we're kind of talking, I, I feel like a broken record here, but, you know, back at the that, back of the lifeguard stand. Right. I would literally go, right? I would literally go into work at 5 a.m., sit on the stand in my mind, go seven, go home seven hours later. And after a month, I had just over sixteen hundred dollars to show from it. That's like 40 hours a week, right? Um, for sixteen hundred bucks, and that was before taxes, right? So I realized that for a whole month of my summer, I wasted literally a third of my month just to get paid a measly paycheck for just over four hundred dollars a week. And that's when I knew there had to be a different path. Let's break down the sales process for you guys, right? Let's break down the sales process for you guys. So you start to understand how this even works, right? So let's say, for example, you see some sort of advertisement online, right? So, so once again, we know that, you know, either starting a business or learning sales is going to be the best way to gain more leverage, right? So we know that. Now, how does the sales process actually work? It's really important we understand that so we can actually, you know, be able to start learning how we can plug our skill sets into this, these businesses, right? So there's this, this product right here called Scalping VIP. Um, and I, I've never used this. I, I don't even know what this is, but um, let's say, for example, you see an ad, right? So you click the ad and it takes you to what we call an opt-in page. Now this opt-in page will generally have some sort of like offer. It's like, you know, hey, this is the world's most profitable scalping indicator. And, and they're pretty much selling trades um, on, on the opt-in page. Now it says that we can get access to for $1, right? Now you might be asking, 
how in the world can this company, right, make profit selling $1 products? Well, the reality is, is that this is just an intro product to show you more information about probably a $3,000, $5,000, $10,000 program on the back end, right? So that's most likely what this is. Now, after you click on that page, you know, there's going to be a place where you add your name, email, phone number, and this is how the companies actually get your information and they can sell you the real money-making products. And our goal is to be the people selling these money-making products because at the end of the day, this is our high ticket product, right? And if you guys remember back over here, right? What do we need? Which profit activators do we need to get paid for our value and not our time? Well, it's get more customers, do repeat business and sell high ticket products. So, right? How do we get more customers? They come here, they buy the $1 product, right? How do we get repeat customers? Well, we sell them our high ticket products. So once again, we fulfill all three profit activators right here, right? And our goal is to be that person on a sales call, right? Where we're actually helping sell these $3,000 to $10,000 programs, right? So after someone buys the $1 product in this example, there will generally be a higher ticket product sold, which is where you come in right? 10% commission on a $10,000 product is about $1,000 that you get to take home. 5% commission on a $10,000 product is $500, right? And Jess, so Jess brings up that $1 has to cover your ad cost to be self-sustaining though, maybe $10 intro price. So once again, and this is actually where I would disagree with that, right? Um, and Jess, I'm not sure what industry you're in. So, so, um, but pardon me here, but at the end of the day, this business is not making money on the $1, right? They, they probably liquidate some of their ad spend. So let's say they spend a hundred thousand dollars a month on this ad, right? If they get, you know, a thousand buyers, right. Or 5,000 buyers from spending a hundred thousand dollars, you know, once again, right. They're, they're going to have 5,000 people that opt in. And then these are going to be the people that actually end up buying our, our high ticket products, right? And Teresa, if, if you're lost, feel free to ask any questions. Um, but once again, we're kind of just breaking down the sales process here, right? So how can you actually go straight to the money? How, how can we clarify this a little bit more? So in order to go straight to the money, right? You must find a way to be that person to take these sales calls, right? So in order to go straight to the money, in order to start earning income in this industry, right, you must find a way to be the person that actually takes these sales calls. So like I said, on average, these companies will be selling a $3,000 to $10,000 product. And if you make 10 to 15% commission, which is the industry average, then that's how the majority of the money is actually made. So there's generally two roles to actually start doing this in the online space. So a lot of you know the students that we work with, everyone's working in the online space, they're able to be fully remote, right? And you know the, the main two roles are, are called an appointment setter or a remote triager. So an appointment setter might actually set sales calls in the DMs. So this might be the direct messages over on Instagram, right? So like, let's say you see all these big influencers, you know, they probably have someone managing their direct messages, right? The other one might actually be someone that's, you know, on a, on a sales call, right? On the phone. So once again, right, remember how we, you know, we, we opt in here, we give, we give our, you know, name, email, phone number, right? A remote triager will be the person actually calling these leads. And let's say you're selling a $10,000 product. Well, if you're making 5% commission, that's $500 every sale that you help bring in, right? For just taking a five to 15 minute phone call. And then lastly, we have a closer, which is someone that actually closes sales calls and deals on the phone. So we have an appointment setter, right? We can either set sales calls in the DMs, right? Set sales calls on the phone, right? Or we can be a closer, sales calls and deals on the phone as well, right? So does that make sense to everyone so far? Just drop a, a yes or a one in the chat if, if that makes sense. But I just want to make sure we kind of understand how the sales process works. And, you know, I just want to make sure everyone's following along. Cool. Awesome. Now, as Cindy asked and, you know, Jess asked, 
right? A closer is generally going to be a higher skill level, right? So if you're closing sales calls and deals on the phone, you know, generally you're going to be making 10 to 15% commission, right? So if you sell $10,000 product, right, you're making $1,000 a sale. So this could literally be $1,000 in one hour of your time once you become really good, right? And we have kids, you know, that are 17 year olds doing this all the way up to, you know, 55, 65, right? And they're basically the sales agent. Yeah. So what's really cool about this though, is that, you know, you're also able to actually come in as a 1099 contractor, right? With your own LLC. So, you know, let's say you set up your own LLC, you're, you know, maybe like a sales agent as, as Cindy puts it, but you're able to set up your LLC and have a lot of tax benefits, right? Serve as almost a freelancer to these businesses. So in a way you're almost running your own business, but just helping take all the, the sales calls and just go straight to the money for these businesses, right? Because they have to do the marketing, they have to do all the complicated stuff. You just get to come in, do the fun stuff, hopping on the phones, closing the deals. And that's how, right, you can make upwards of, you know, $100 an hour or even more, right? Because these businesses, they need you in order to have success. So the better that you are, the more money you'll make and the more leverage that you have, right? Right? So how do we determine your pay? Well, let's say you're, you know, really good and you're booking six calls a day for a business, right? That sells a $5,000 offer. And our setters do this frequently, you know, by crushing on the phone. So we actually have setters as well um, and, and closers as we, as we call them, I guess. Um, but let's check out the business economics, right? So let's say, for example, you're a setter and you're booking six calls a day, right? So you book six calls a day. Um, maybe you work eight hours in the day, you know, cause you're just a beginner. Now, let's say you want to work 22 days out of the month, right? So you have 132 calls that are booked throughout the month. So just, just, just to make sure, like, does this make sense to everyone so far? Just drop a yes in the chat if this makes sense for, for the business economics and the money-making math, right? But let's say you're booking six calls a day, you work eight hours a day, right? And you have 132 book calls. Now, right here, the biggest thing is that the time doesn't matter, right? If it took you, you know, one hour, right? If it took you one hour to book six calls, you get paid the same amount, right? So if you're just better, right, you're going to make more money. So that's the biggest thing there. Now, let's say, for example, we have an 80% show rate. So 105 calls show up, 40% close, right? So we have 42 deals closed and it's a $5,000 offer at a 7% commission. So you're making about $350 per close deal. Now the take home pay is $350 times 42, right? Because we closed 42 deals, $350 per closed deal. And that's $14,700 in the whole month, right? I mean, who would be pretty happy with that, right? Who would be happy making $14,700 a month? Drop a yes in the chat. That'd be cool. Sweet. So, Let's say, for example, right, we want to do this part time and we're not even that good, right? So let's say we, because, you know, a lot of us, you know, starting just out the gate, you know, maybe we're not going to be able to book six calls, right? So let's say, for example, we book three calls a day, right? Once again, the time doesn't matter because it's just about our skill. But let's say we book three calls, 26 days in a month, 78 of these calls show, um, are booked, right? Because three times 26. And then 80% of these calls actually show up. So this is 62 calls that are showing up, right? Ready to go. Let's say there's a 40% um, close rate, right? 25 deals close. And with that, right? Because it's a $5,000 offer, 7% commission, you know, 350 per close deal. Then still part-time, right? We're making $8,750 in the whole month. Right. And that's if we're not very good. Right. So how many of us or how many of you guys, you know, think that making eight thousand dollars in a month would still be pretty cool. Right. And and we can even break this down with different with different economics. Right. Because let's say you're you're still a beginner. Right. And you only want to work 20 days, you know, two hours a day. And maybe we can get up to like two book calls. Well, 
still, right? Let's keep all the same math, right? Two, so we book two calls a day, working 20 days, working two hours. So we're working 40 hours the whole month, right? And then we kind of just want to like, you know, do whatever, right? So 40, let's say 80% show. So that's 32 calls, 40% close out of these 32. So I think it's like, it's like, I think it's like 12.8, right? 12.8. And that's about half. So, you know, this is 12.8. So this is about give or take, right? This would be about um, like $4,000, right? So we could be not very good. We're two hours a day, 20 days a month, right? $4,000. <laughs> Jazz wants to start, right? So can you guys see how this is still pretty solid? right? Keegan said something about language barrier. So once again, right, there's businesses all over the world, right? Let's say you speak Italian, you need to find, find an Italian business. Let's say, say you speak Spanish, right? Maybe you work with a, a business that does deals in Spanish, right? At the end of the day, just like, you know, English is my first language. So that's what we teach in. Um, but I mean, I'm learning, you know, other languages too. Um, but yeah, I mean, it just depends on, you know, what language you're selling in, right? So, could we all see ourselves doing that just based off the math here, right? Because like, hey, this stuff's really cool, but we have to be able to make money. So, so do you guys see how this kind of works? And and Jas is asking, you know, high ticket products, right? A lot of the people and the students that we teach, like they're all helping sell digital products online, right? Because these all fulfill, right? What do digital products fulfill? Well, they fulfill Jay Abraham's profit activators, right? High ticket products, digital products, right? They're high ticket, you can do repeat business, you can get more customers and it's location independent, right? So you don't have to be in an office doing that, right? Because once again, right, you wanna be where you can have location independency, right? And, and if you wanna be in person, I think that's totally fine too, right? I think if you wanna be in person, but for me, right, I wanted to travel to Greece, right? This is out in Greece. You know, I wanted to drive supercars in Dubai, right? I wanted to travel to Aruba. And the only way I was able to do that and still make money is because I was selling digital products, right? So now let's hop into, you know, step three here, right? Leverage income. Now, maybe you guys can relate, maybe not. I, I felt this way when I was a lifeguard, but corporations have a tendency to forget the importance of having a work-life balance. For me, I like more of a work work balance and then we add life in and you know it's it's been more life recently with with Maria that's been awesome but I, I love to work however a lot of people don't always want to work right um you know I, I have some friends at Google and Microsoft they actually really love their jobs um it seems like awesome workplaces but you know a lot of a lot of corporations right you know a lot of corporations it's more about a work, work, work balance, right? With all nine to fivers treated as a number really than, you know, anything else. And the benefit, right, of having a skill with unlimited earning potential is that you'll always be able to be paid more because you're paid for your value, not your time, which means that you can charge a massive premium, right? So you can get paid based on your value and not the 40 to 80 hours that you're working a week. Because with all of this, right, and as Keegan's asking, He's asking, hey, what products are we selling, right? All of these people are already interested in our products, right? The people that we're selling, let's say we're on a trading offer, the people that we're selling are all, they all opted in for an ad. So they're pretty much raising their hand, hey, sell me, right? All of these people are, want to, you know, do trading in this example, right? So they're all interested people and it's not just like random cold calls. So you're selling people that already want the product, right? Now, the best part about this, right? Is that it doesn't even take you like it doesn't matter if it takes you 10 hours to close a deal or 30 minutes because you're paid the same amount just for the output that you provide so if you're better right if you have more leverage then that's that's going to make you more money right and that's what's allowed me you know to travel do all the things this is out in france right with, with some of our buddies um because in a normal nine to five right Maybe it's $20 an hour. Okay, we work 60 hours a week. Okay, we get paid $1,200 per month. Then we make $4,800 per month. And then we're trading 240 hours of our life every single um, every single month to $4,800 before taxes, 
right? On the sales economics, it's, hey, it doesn't matter once again on the hours. Hey, we booked six calls, 22 days in the month, 132 book calls a month. We're making 14 grand a month, right? To make more money, you just need more leverage, right? And I hope you guys can see why this is. Now, a lot of you guys, and, and I'm curious, maybe you guys have thought this, how is a sales system emotionless, right? How is, you know, Kikoa, how is this process different, right? Well, there's really two big factors that we keep this three-step emotionless selling system, you know, actually emotionless. Because at the end of the day, right, because we understand our numbers and we know our money-making math, we're able to remove all emotions from the actual income that we're making. Because if we know our numbers, if we know that, hey, if we take X amount of calls, you know, and we make X amount of money, then we just have to have more calls to make more money, right? Or we increase our skill set. So the better we get at sales, the more money we make, right? So these are the two levers on our inputs. Hey, we just got better at sales. Okay, we're going to make more money. Hey, we just did more inputs and we know our close rate. We know our, you know, show up rates. Cool, we're going to make more money. And unlike other sales reps, right? We don't let our emotions get the best of us when we get hit with objections or other hard things in the sale, right? We keep our frame and we stay on track, ultimately allowing us to make more money, right? So I'm going to hop in now, um, kind of going over the three steps for the sales process that we kind of want to go through. Um, but who's enjoying this so far? Have we felt like we've got value so far? Just drop a one in the chat. Um, I guess if you feel like you've got value, um, and if not, you can drop a two as well. If this was a complete waste of time, <laughs> I hope it wasn't a complete waste of time. Zach, will it be recorded? Yep. I believe it should be recorded. Oh. Cool. Cool. Martin said a 69. Sweet. Now, what are the three steps? Well, we have discovery, widening the gap, objection handling, right? So that's the, if you focus on these three things in the sales call, you'll crush it, right? So what is discovery? Well, every prospect has a certain belief system that they brought with them throughout their whole life. So every sales call that we hop on, we need to understand what that prospect's belief system is, the pain that they're going through, and the desires that they have, right? So in order to actually understand the thought process of this prospect, we need to ask the proper questions so we can understand their pain and desire that they have, right? So how do we do this? Well, we have to follow our framework. Right. So during our exploration phase, we need to learn why the prospect is even interested in the first place here. Right. So a question that I might ask in the sales call after I set my frame, I, I do all the things I might be like, Hey, is this John? Hey, John. Awesome, man. I, I mean, what really stuck out to you about the ad that you saw that prompted you to reach out? Right. So let's say, for example, I'm selling a trading offer. Hey, John, yeah, I just saw you just opted in for our new powerful scalping VIP indicator, right? I mean, what has you really looking into something like this, right? What stuck out to you about the ad that, you know, prompted you to reach out, John? Now, from here, we'll then kind of dive into what we call probing questions. Okay, cool, John. I mean, tell me more when you say X, Y, Z, right? Okay, cool, John. What do you mean by that, right? Hey, when you say X, Y, Z, John, what do you mean exactly, right? So hopefully we can start to see it's really important how we explore, right? We need to really explore what the prospect is, is going through, right? And why this even is a good fit. Because we're not trying to sell anyone just like random shit, right? We need to make sure that it actually works for them, right? Because that's ethically just what you should do. So I might ask like, cool, John, like, what are you doing for work right now? Oh, like, how's that going for you? 
gotcha, John. I mean, are, are you enjoying that right now? Like, you know, how's that going? Oh, you don't enjoy it? Gotcha, man. I mean, have, have you felt that way for a long time? So here, these are called probing and exploration questions. So do we see how this can start to like allow a prospect to open up and allow us to actually get to, right, their pain, desires, and, and understand their belief system? Just drop a yes in the chat if you guys are seeing that and, and how we're building rapport. Cindy says, yeah, building rapport. Carla, cool. So the types of questions we really ask during discovery is a huge indicator of our success in sales. Hey, what sort of questions, right, do we ask? And there's multiple different philosophical ways of like how this is like described. A lot of people also call this the Socratic method um, for like why, like the reasoning behind why we ask these, you know, questions. But um, I might ask like, cool, John, I mean, have you felt that way for a long time? Uh, I mean, has that had a big impact on you? And notice my tonality there as well, right? Inside, you know, with our students, we obviously have a ton more trainings on tonality, but, um, you know, un understand that. Gotcha, John, I mean, has that you know, maybe made things difficult for you? How, how does that look? Oh, can you give me an example of, of that, John? Tell me more, right? Now, what are some other things, right? So desired situation. Gotcha, John. So, so you mentioned, you know, you were working on XYZ, right? Which seems more in the short term. I mean, what's really the long-term goal? So once again, right, you have to get to pain, desires, belief system. So we're understanding, hey, why they're interested. Cool. What's the desired situation? Cool, John. I mean, you know, you mentioned X, Y, Z, which seems more in the, you know, in the next six to 12 months. I mean, what's really the long-term goal for you, would you say? Right? So we're starting to understand, hey, what are short-term goals, long-term goals? Because every, every prospect, right, every prospect is in some sort of pain and they have some sort of desire, right? And they have to make a change. They're in some pain and they have some desire that they have to make a change on, right? Now, when I roll through here, right? I might start asking them, cool. I mean, what's your monetary goal, right? Okay, you know, $100,000. Okay, cool. I mean, it seems like you've thought of, right? That number before. I mean, can I ask John, why, why that number? Like, why is a hundred thousand even important? Oh, it's because my family, I want to travel. I want to do X, Y, Z. Right. And we're going to have some people coming up in the house here. We have, a uh, we have like four or five people staying here, but, um, but yeah, so that's, that's kind of what it looks like. Right. And how much money, right, would you really have to be or really have to have in order to replace the amount of income that you're making full time? You know, gotcha, John. I mean, what, what are you really doing for work right now? Is the ultimate goal to transition out of that job? So can you guys start seeing the types of questions that I'm asking and how that's taking us down a set path to get the prospect to open up about what we want them to open up about? Drop a yes in the chat if, if you guys can see how these questions are actually aligning and actually helping us work towards a sale. Because the, because the types of questions we're asking are the most important. Gotcha, John. I mean, is replacing that income enough to allow you to actually leave the job? Okay, got it. And, and I mean, how much ideally would you be making? You know, given the, the drop in income, I mean, has that put you in a tough place financially? Right? So yeah, like, like Remus and, and Teresa are saying, like the biggest thing is, hey, building trust and rapport here to really connect with the prospects, but also get them to open up and, you know, allow us to convert them into the sale, right? And, and, then, and then this is what I call like kind of a tie down, right? This is a tie down here with, you know, remote triaging and, and sales. But like, let's say I'm selling like a trading product. Gotcha, John. I mean, do you feel like, you know, with learning something like trading or something like sales, this would allow you to make more money to actually achieve X, Y, Z, right? So achieve your goals and get out of X, Y, Z pain. Do you see that? Cool, John. And I mean, have you looked into other programs before? What does that kind of look like? Right? 
So all throughout this situ like this scenario, we're exploring why they're interested. Hey, what is your pain? What is your goal? Right. And then also we we're now addressing how we, you know, can actually help lead them either to purchase our product or to push the prospect into a different direction to give them different advice. Right. So another question I might ask is, oh, I mean, have you tried solving this problem in the past? Right. Have you looked into other, you know, solutions? Oh, how did those go? Right. Gotcha, Don. So, I mean, what really has you looking into something like this now, right? So, you know, let's say that they tried other programs, but then I might even ask like, cool, John, I mean, is this something urgent for you to change now? Or what does that really look like? You know, what, what sort of change would you want to make here, John? Cool. I mean, what even has you looking into, you know, our paid mentorship rather than looking at some of these, you know, free resources on YouTube, there's tons of stuff out there. Right. Um, and Paul is asking, would we be talking to the prospect in person? So once again, right, this frame works for in-person sales, you know, over the phone. A lot of this stuff that was digital, right? So a lot of this is over the phone. So yeah, I mean, I think it just depends on what, what time zone you're in, right? Um, and then some other questions, right? That we always pretty like kind of want to address. So after I kind of run them through the the scripts and frameworks, I might even ask, like, gotcha. I mean. You know, and do you have a family right now? Like, what does that kind of look like? Okay, cool. I mean, is your wife and husband supportive of you? Right? Oh, do they know you're looking into solving this solution? Do you feel like they would be supportive of you, you know, getting out of XYZ and into XYZ goals? Right? And, and I wouldn't say it's really working for a call center. Like, like I think this sort of sales is is way different. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Someone said skip the call center. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Right. Um. So yeah, that's like the biggest thing, right? And then and then another question I might ask is, oh, like, do you feel like, you know, you'd be stuck if you stay in that same situation, right? So we have to have some sort of urgency, Matt, like to get the to, to push the deal across the line. Because if there's no urgency, right, then the pain's not deep enough. So a big part of discovery is really getting to the core pain and being able to truly help the prospect by understanding their pain. Because if we don't understand their pain, it's going to be really difficult to actually help them get, get the solution that they need, right? And once again, right, um, you know, just to show that this works, you know, we had, I think this was Christian um, in our community, right? He was just like, yeah, if you're, if you're not a lazy person and, and ready to learn, right, I fully recommend you go for this right? Amazing community coaches that can help you teach. We got Alex and Ryan, some awesome guys. Um, and he had some tips, right? Find yourself two to three partners that you can consistently practice, you know, these sort of, these sorts of questions with, right? Um, you know, don't be afraid to fail, right? Don't expect to pass graduation calls. We actually have like a whole graduation process we take, you know, our students through and it's just like take action, right? Um, Ali here, he's 19 years old. 600 bucks. I'm not sure if the deal size was 600 or if he made $600. Um, but I mean, that's awesome. So, you know, it, it's working right now. Step number two, and, and I guess just drop a yes in the chat. If you guys are, are following along so far, I just want to make sure that this process makes sense. And, and you guys are following along. We can see this working, right? Cool. So next step here, right, is how do we actually widen the gap? Because on any call, right, there needs to be pain, right? Why, why does anyone buy? Because they're in a pain, right? Why, why did I buy this food? Right, I got some chicken here. We got some tzatziki sauce, like from a Greek place. Why did I buy food? Well, my pain was that I was hungry. My pain is that, um, you know, I, I'm working out right now. I, I, I need more protein. So I want to eat chicken, right? That's my pain. And my desire is to satisfy my hunger, right? That's literally the reason why I buy food. That's how they sold me, 
right? So by far the most important aspect of any call is you have to understand the prospect's pain and what they're currently lacking and experiencing in their life, right? And all of your questions should be getting the prospect to open up about this, right? Find the pain, get the sale. If you can really dive deep to the root of that pain and continue getting the prospect to talk, right? Continue to widen the gap. Then that means that ethically, right? You're going to win the sale. And more importantly, you're going to help the prospect to actually reach their goals, right? Because yeah, the money's great, but if you're not actually helping the person, like why are you selling them, <laughs> right? And in, in order to be able to help the person, you have to ask questions so we can take them from their before state to their dream state, right? And our solution is that bridge of the gap here, right? Now, during the pain stage, this is the before state, our goal is to get the prospect towards the far left-hand side of the red before state, right? The farther left they are on the diagram, the larger the gap will be to their dream state. So we need to take them to their dream state. And the only solution, right, left to get to their dream state will be our bridge to take them, right? And this is the product or service that we're selling, but to take them from the before state into their dream state, right? Now, let's say, for example, there's there's doubt, right? So, so we have to have pain um, in order to make the sale, right? Now, another belief, right, is that there has to be some sort of doubt that the prospect cannot achieve your solution or the, the solution, right, without your help. So it's very important that throughout the whole process, you're understanding that, hey, like, what have you actually tried before to solve this solution? Okay, and, and how did those, you know, potential, those prospective solutions actually go for you? Oh, they didn't work? Oh, why is that? Right, okay, so they tried things in the past, but you know, there's doubt now that they can achieve the solution without your help, right? So our goal here is through the questions we ask to actually find the doubt that they have if they were to go out on their own, because they need you, right? They hop in the call because they need to change their life. It's your duty to enroll them, right? And to help them change their life. As a salesperson, that's what you have to do. Because if you don't, I, I like to think of this as, as a suicide negotiator, right? Let's say your prospect's, you know, on a bridge, about to jump off, right? They're about to jump off the bridge. They're about to jump to their death, right? Really dark. Well, if you don't ask the, if, as, if you as the suicide negotiator don't ask the proper questions, if you don't calm the prospect down, then they jump and they die. That's how a sales call is every single time. If you let the prospect get off the sales call, they, they died, right? They're not getting help. So you have to understand them at such a deep level with the questions you're asking. Otherwise, you're going to let them die, right? You have to be able to take them, you know, from this before state, this extreme pain to relief to their dream, right? And if you let them go, if you don't bridge that gap, you just, you let the prospect die, right? So we can't have that. Now, how do we invoke doubt into someone's mind? And this is from a video sales letter. So this is like copywriting, like, but copywriting is also sales. So like it kind of goes hand in hand, but for example, in a video sales letter, right? Um, for example, it's like, you know, hey, take the information I've given you here today, Try to figure it out by yourself, right? Um, and if you try, if you do this, I mean, this could happen because you might lose valuable months or even years trying to figure out everything on your own. You know, long term, it's probably going to be more expensive. You'd miss out on all the extra money you could have made if starting out the right way from the get go, right? Or option two, you choose to join the program with the best success stories in the industry, where we take you by the hand to do X Y Z, X Y Z, you know, and get clients. I think this is like for a SMMA offer. I, I forget what this was for, but um, hopefully you guys can see that, hey, there's like a two option route. So this is like kind of a sales, like a sales process right here, but it's like, hey, you could do this, right? And still stay in your before state or you do our product, right? We bridge this gap here and we take you to exactly where you want to go, right? 
right? So right here, option one clearly has a goal to put down in your mind as a viewer and then compare it to option two where the solution is displayed. And then when talking with the prospect, it's really important to dive into doubt and push the knife into the pain to exasperate it, right? Once this prospect is solution aware, there's really two things which could happen, right? They either want to solve it themselves, right? And their ego gets in the way because they think they're too good for help, right? Or they don't want help at all because they doubt their ability, right? So there's two things that could prevent the sale from happening. The prospect wants to solve it themselves, right? Because they're like, yeah, I'm, I'm smarter than this, whatever, I'll figure it out. And then they don't, right? You let them jump off the bridge, right? So if you let the prospect's ego get in the way, then you just let them die. And if they don't want help because they doubt your ability, well, you didn't ask them the proper questions or provide them the leadership and coaching that was necessary. And they also jump off the bridge, right? If the buyer is severely depressed, well, you have to ask the right questions to understand, gotcha, why are you depressed? What, is depress what does depression mean to you? Oh, I'm unhappy with how much money I'm making. Okay, gotcha. What, what have you tried to do to solve that? Oh, I've tried X, Y, Z. Gotcha. How, how did that go? Oh, I didn't work very hard. Oh, why did you not work very hard? Uh, I don't know. Gotcha. So how can we help you resolve this so we can get you out of that depressed state into X, Y, Z solution? That's exactly how I would do it. <laughs> Right. Once again, if, if you don't ask the proper questions, you just let them jump. Right. So it's on you. Um, and maybe that sounds harsh, but I, I think that's the reality. Right. So um, let's go over the realm of buying now. Right. So so right here. Right. We have the realm of buying. So the prospect has the current state. Right. And they have their desired state. Now. Right here, right, there's going to be doubt that it's possible. So we have, to, let, let's say a prospect has self-doubt. Let, let's say some, that prospect you're talking to on the phone has self-doubt here, right? Well, we needed to display to them why, you know, through coaching and leadership, why our product or service would be the best to take them from the current state into the realm of where they, you know, want to buy, right? And the other hand, you know, if the prospect wants to do it themselves, well, also, you know, we have to also show, hey, you could do this by yourself, but it's also going to be, right, way harder, right, lose valuable months, it's going to be more expensive, etc. Right, do that, right. So we need to show how we can get them back into the realm of buying. Right. So can you guys see how how, how this can work? Right. Like, do we see that sorts of questions, like the questions we're starting to ask, like all of sales is questions. Right. But, but do you guys start, start to see this? Just drop a yes in the chat if this is making sense or if it's completely off, you can let me know. I'm happy to answer questions. Cool. Awesome. We haven't fallen asleep yet. It's 1035 for me, guys. Cool. So it's really important to keep the prospect 835. Okay. You guys, you guys are lucky. That's nice. Now, it's very important to keep the uh Remus up at 335. Bro, you're a tank. Okay. So once again, right, it's really important though to keep the prospect in the realm of buying by showing them your solution is the key to getting out of, out of your pain, right? And Remus over here, right? He wants to get out of the, the situation he's in, right? Remus is ready to go. 3.35 a.m. showing up, learning sales. Like, that's fucking awesome, right? Now, we'll be covering this more in the framework, so I'll break down later, but hopefully this should set a good precedent. Now, another thing that a prospect considers on every purchase decision, right? Sacrifice. So the next thing that a prospect goes through when making a purchase decision is the sacrifice that they must make, right? Whether that's time, money, or effort required. So the more sacrifice that's required, right, in a decision-making process, the more conviction the prospect will need in order to make that purchase decision. Therefore, 
it's our job to show how the sacrifice they will make from buying will be less than the sacrifice they would have, right? If they do not buy. So we need to show that, hey, you know, doing it themselves is going to be way harder than if you just make the sacrifice, right? Um, and, and you're ultimately going to get way better results. It's going to be faster and it's going to take a lot less time, right? If you make this purchase decision. So hopefully you guys can see this here. We either have doing it themselves where they don't buy or the purchase, purchase decision. Time spent and money required doing it themselves is greater than if they were to purchase. So if, for example, right, if the sacrifice that's being made, right, so if the time spent or money required doing it themselves is greater than if they were to actually purchase the product, right, then they're going to make the purchase. However, if the time spent or money required is less than if they were to buy, right, then they're going to do it themselves. So let's, so Jess wants an example. Let's use um, plastic surgery and working out, right? So what, like, what is going to be easier? Like, let's say you want to look good. I, I think a lot of the plastic surgery is kind of messed up, honestly, but let's say, you know, you want to look like Kylie Jenner and you get your lips, whatever, right? And you want to lose all your fat and, and you want to, whatever, perfect body. So let's say you can either work out or get plastic surgery, right? What's going to be easier in terms of effort and time required? Well, plastic surgery probably takes like two or three hours, four hours, you go in, fixed, right? So the time and effort required is very low. So what sacrifice is gonna have to be made there? A lot of money. I think a plastic surgery thing is like 10 grand, mm -hmm. right? The BBL. Yeah. But once again, right, way more money and, and it goes. Now, let's say you don't have money, right? Or you just like want to be healthy, then you go to the gym. But that's going to take way more time, takes a lot of effort, right? You know, and you have to eat well, right? So why is plastic surgery so popular? Because it saves all the time and effort required. Right. It's a very easy purchase decision for someone that has the money and wants to look good with zero time spent and zero effort because you just pay a machine goes and then boom, you look like how you want to look, which is kind of scary, honestly. But hopefully you guys can see that. Right. And it's the same thing. It's like, why did I order food? Right. I think we pay like three dollars extra. Is it worth it for me to go walk to the food place? And I think it was like raining earlier. Is it worth it for me to go walk in the rain to get the food, you know, do all that. And then I have to come back, right. Spend an hour, get wet. Or do I rather just pay $4 and it's delivered. Right. It's the era of convenience. Now desire. Um, there's a lot more, right. Yeah. I mean, that's like, like wh why would you use Uber? Right. Like we don't have a car in Brazil. Why? Why would we have a car? Well, it's probably more, it's going to be more expensive and more of a hassle having a car, having to park it. You have to pay, you know, for the car, et cetera. Right. And most of the places we can walk to in Brazil. So I'd rather just Uber for the places that we need. It's like, you know, $4. Right. So I, I'd much rather Uber. <laughs> I, I, I kind of agree. I agree. It reminds me of the movie Wally. A hundred percent. Kind of scary. Right. Now, number four, desire. So desire is the belief. So this is like the, the belief that the prospect wishes to get what they want, right? So this is the dream destination for where the prospect wants to end up after making a purchase decision. So it's your goal throughout the whole sales process to uncover this desire along with the pain the prospect's actually going through. Here, we want to continue widening the gap between the pain and desire that a prospect has. We want to exacerbate the pain while truly understanding the desire. And we, it might, the conversation flow might go like this. Cool, Don, I mean, what's really the end goal for you? Oh, more money would be nice, right? A lot of sales reps don't really ask deeper things here. Okay, cool. You want to make more money. I mean, what would you be doing with more money? Yeah, traveling the world, seeing some new things. I want to go to Cancun. Gotcha. Cancun's beautiful from what I've heard. I mean, have you been there before? Like, why, why is that important? Oh, I've wanted to go there since I was a kid. I have a family, two kids, haven't had a vacation. So 
Gotcha, man. I mean, you must have a lovely wife. I mean, what's really holding you back from taking that vacation? Oh, I can't. I'm stuck in my job, right? Desired state, spend more time with the family. Why does he want more money? Spend more time with the family. Why does he want vacation? Take care of the family. Desire. Can he do that now? No. That's the, that's the before state, desired state, right? So in this uncovering stage, the prospect says that they want more money, but that's not really the end desire. And that's what a lot of people... It takes a while to understand that, but why does that like, what, what, and I'm curious what, what you guys would think, but like, why does anyone here want to make more money? Why, why do we want to make more money for me? Right. It's, you know, starting a family soon, right. You know, buying a, buying a house. We're still traveling a lot, but eventually buy a house. Right. So, so why do we all want to make more money? If you, if you drop that in the chat, we can, we can go through that. Sydney wants to support her family comfortably, leave something behind them. John wants to be with his partner, right? Have an, have an apartment together. Brian, legacy. Send kids to college, pay off debts. Better wife, life for the wife and kids. Right? Olemi says, yeah, better life for the wife and kids. Abhinav, be successful. India wants to be independent and help others. Stability for the wife and I. Jazz wants eye surgery, better life, right? But what does a better life mean? I, I think it's also really important to define what that even means. What is a better life? Location freedom, okay, cool. Why? What, what does location freedom mean? Like, do you wanna travel? five times a year, 10 times a year, like work wherever, peace and happiness, right? So what is happiness like? Well, what does happiness mean? For me, right, for, for the longest time, and, and I still kind of think this this way, but I, I've i never been a one to pursue happiness because I think happiness is always fleeting. I think life is about more fulfillment, you know, taking care of the people around you, right? Being fulfilled through what you're doing, through the people you spend your time with, right? But that's that's me, right? What is happiness? Better life means more less stress, more peace. Okay. What what is stressful right now? <laughs> okay, what is stressful? Right? Debt is stressful, sure. Everything's stressful. Money is what couples fight over. Ret retirement means massive money, right? So hopefully you guys can start seeing, okay, these are the things that are stressing me out in life, right? How do I actually change what's going on in my life right now and get to the desired outcome? We all just went through the exact state we're in, right? We all just went through and we wrote, hey, this is what stresses me out. Right now, it's not being able to take care of the family, not being able to move in with anything. <laughs> Cindy wants to be an outlaw now, right? <sighs> Go against the grain, right? Because once again, we got to go from the four state into dream state, right? So that was the first two steps of the sales process, right? Jermaine just said that the nine to five is not enough to pay rent or the mortgage, right? So we got to make a change, right? Now, hopefully you guys got some value from that so far, uh, but we're not done. Um, we're going to be going over the third step. So today, right, we went over the money-making math. Um, we're kind of going through leveraged income. Um, and now we're going through the three-step emotionless selling system. We went over discovery and we went over widening the gap. Who's ready for some objection handling? Are we ready for some objection handling? This is the third step to the three-step emotionless selling system. Are, are we ready for that? Cool. Drop a yes in the chat if you guys want to go through the third and final step here for our three-step emotionless selling system. Yep. Cool. I got some chicken here.
So, as Teresa says, sounds like rejection, right? Who's ready to get rejected? I am. I embrace rejection. Just kidding. Always no. Um, would we be given a copy of this doc? Um, yeah, if you guys uh came on the webinar, we'll export the list of all the people and then we'll try to send it out. Would that be helpful if, if we gave everyone this doc? Yeah. I'm an objector reflector. Cool guys. Um, well, yeah, if you guys stick around, I'll, I'll send the link here at the end, um, just after this, because, uh, because we'll have some stuff, but yeah, if we stick around, we'll, we, we can make sure to send over, uh, this link. So I just have to like change some like sharing features. I don't really know. Well, we'll do that. But okay, anyways, um, so price objection. So let's say someone, so this is a, this is at the end of a sales call, right? So just for context, this is at the end of the sales call, right? End of the sales call, this, this might be what happens. So the prospect might be like, okay, yeah, John, product sounds good. Yeah, um, it's too much money though. Can we do a payment plan, right? So the prospect here is likely interested in what we have, but may have some other objection. So we want to tie them down that this is in fact the best solution, right? And that they should be ready to go. So here, here's what I might say. Um, so, so let's say I'll, I'll be the prospect first and then I'll, and I'll be um, the, the salesperson. So yeah, Kiko, it's too much money. I mean, can we like, can we do something cheaper? Like, can we do a payment plan? So in this case, right? Let's say I'm, I'm responding to that. I'll say something like this. Totally understand, John. I mean, tell me if you had the money here, right? If you had the money here, do you feel like, right? This is something that would work for you. So a lot of the times price objections is that they don't trust you, right? Oh, can we do a payment plan? Yeah. They just don't really trust you, but there's something off about the process. So in this case, I'll be like, totally understand, John. I mean, tell me if, if you had the money here, I mean, do you feel like this is something that would work for you? hundred percent. Yeah. Cool. And tell me, John, why do you feel like this would work for you? Why would X, Y, Z solution work for you, right? Okay, cool. And then, so so th those would be the diffusing statement and then rebuttal statement, exploration. Cool, John. And I can appreciate that money might be the issue from what you told me. John, how do you feel like we can resolve that so you can find the money here so you can hit X, Y, Z goal, right? And as Jazz said, right, some people are broke. Some people literally just won't be able to ever afford it. But a lot of the times they can't afford it. They just don't want to pay it, right? Um, and, and I'll pull up this example because we, we ran this on the last webinar. But let's, let's use a Ferrari because I, I just like Ferraris. Um, let, let's use a Ferrari F90 Strasdale, right? Um, it's a $500,000 car. Right. But if I came to you, let's say, you know, let's say we have, you know, 50 grand to spend on a car, you know, we're, we're going to get like a Toyota, but I have 50 grand to spend on the car. Well, if someone comes to me and tells me, Koa, I can get you this Ferrari, you know, SF 90 for a hundred grand today. Right. It's worth 500, 500,000, but I'll give it to you for a hundred grand. Do you think I'm going to figure out a way to get another $50,000 to buy the Ferrari? Probably. I would be pretty stupid not to, right? So a lot of the times it's not too expensive. The, the prospect just doesn't want it, right? Or the pain's not big enough, right? And it's not even convincing them that they need it, right? The, the prospect should convince themselves. It should be so obvious, right? If the value is there, if there's enough pain, if there's you know enough desire, like why would you not make the change, right? Right? So once again, generally the prospect will have some other objection besides money. Our goal 
during the rebuttal stage is to get the prospects to tell us the exact objection they have and why they feel that this may or may not work for them specifically. Okay. Let's say now um, there's another objection. Okay, product complexity, right? Maybe you're in software sales. Yeah, it seems too complicated, John. Okay, cool, John. Um, yeah, I mean, tell me, I, I guess in your mind, what makes this seem complicated? Oh, it's, you know, um, it, it seems like it would be hard to learn. Gotcha, John. I, I mean, based on our conversation here so far, I mean, do you feel like this is really something that could get you to where you want to be if you had a mentor that could walk you through exactly how to get over any road bumps and, and things in your path? Yes, I do. I oh, gotcha. Remind me, John, why, why is that? Right? Why do you feel like this would work for you? So do we see the conversation flow? Instead of just breaking down, acting all emotional, I'm emotionless. Boom. It's the same thing. Boom, boom, boom. Every time. Right? Cool, John. I mean, what makes this seem complicated? Okay, cool, John. So I guess if you had a mentor that was walking you through the exact process, for how to achieve all this. I, I, I mean, do you feel like it still would be complicated? Right here, we're unpacking other objections that they might have, right? Real objection. Most likely it's not that it doesn't seem too complicated, right? It's the prospect doesn't trust you. They don't believe in the product. They don't see this as the route to get there. But if they do actually see this as the route to uh, help them achieve their goals, then, right, that's when we can really branch out and start understanding a little bit more like where they're at, right? Let's say, for example, your, the prospect says your product doesn't have specific features that we need. Totally understand, John. I mean, what would be the ideal feature you need? So if you had XYZ feature or solution, do you feel like that's all you would need to help you get out of XYZ pain into XYZ goal? Right? That's how we handle that objection. Totally understand, John. I mean, what other ideal feature would you need? So if you had this feature, do you feel like you would be able to achieve those goals? Right. So, so drop a yes in the chat if, if we're understanding objection handling here, because this is like some pretty like in-depth stuff. Um, I know this is a lot. I'm like literally a two hour presentation, but does that make sense? Cool. If you guys crush this, I mean, you're making fucking 20, 20 racks a month with this. Once you know how to objection handle, you can get good discovery, like, and you're on a decent offer. I mean, 10K, like minimum, like easy, right? And this is the sauce, right? This is what it takes. Let's say um, prospect says bad timing. Yeah, this is not really a good time for us to do this. Cool, John. I mean, when do you feel like a good time would be for you? Earlier on this call, you mentioned that you were in a you know pretty tight situation. You know, bills were a lot, like you couldn't really spend time with your family. I mean, it sounds like now would be the perfect time. So, so kind of walk me through. Oh, I have to think about it. Gotcha, John. So I, I guess in that time, what would you really be considering, you know, in regards to getting started with something like this? There's likely a different objection that the prospect actually has with your service, right? Like there's not enough value, like they, they don't see it working for them. Like you, you got you got to figure this out. So that's I mean, like, and, and when you guys review the doc, like I just practice these, but like, that's huge, right? Another one, can I think about it and get back to you in a, in a week? Oh yeah, totally, totally, John. I mean, in those few weeks, what would you be thinking about? Once again, whatever they say, that's the real objection. Another way I might diffuse this, so there's two diffusing statements I could use. Totally understand, John. I mean, what's the difference between getting started with, you know, something like this next week or today? Yeah, I just want to talk it over with my wife. Gotcha. I mean, what would, how would that conversation go? Right. Um, so once again, this is this is likely a different objection that the prospect actually has with your service. And you can use other loops on this training to handle it. Um, if it's just waiting, though, we could transition into what we call a consequence question. So then we'll say, like, gotcha. So so let's say we run through this whole loop. And then it's like, gotcha. So I guess if we wait a few weeks to make this decision, John, which ultimately based on our prior conversation is something that you said yourself, you feel like could get you out of X, Y, Z pain and, you know, moving towards X, Y, Z goals. I mean, what would really happen then? Uh, how would we really be able to help you achieve that? Right. 
Do we see how, how these, these questions are all coming together? Right? So Sydney, this is, um, you wanna see what is exactly being sold. Sorry, can, can we clarify that question? Solutions need to be flexible. Cool. Um, and then lastly, right, we'll just run through a partner authority spouse objection. Um, I need to discuss this with my brother, right? So once again, right, gotcha, that's not a problem. I mean, how does your brother... <laughs> yeah, in the next training, I'm going to try to have another person on the call so we can actually like role play live. That'll probably be the easiest, but um, I'm like the rep and then John is like pretending that he has the objection, right? Understand the process. Yeah, so Sydney, this is like for any, like this is for any product. This is like any digital product. Like this is for anything. Like this is for software sales. This could be for insurance. You know, this is, I, I mean, like a lot of the time, like in, in B2B or SaaS, for example, right? This isn't a good time for us. Like they would say that like even an insurance, I, I think Cindy, you mentioned your insurance. Yeah. It's not really a good time for us to get started with insurance right now. Um, I'd be like, gotcha, John. I mean, when do you feel like would be a good time earlier? You mentioned, um, you know, your, your, your wife was trying to retire soon. Um, you know, you, you want to set things up for the kids, you know, I guess when would getting life insurance really you know, be a good, good fit for you. It seems like now really is the right time. Cool, John. So, so I guess in that, you know, next week or so, what would you really be considering about to understand, you know, if you would be getting started with us with the life insurance here or with this life insurance policy? I, I've never sold insurance before, so, so I'm not sure like necessarily how those conversations go, but like, that's how I would run objection handling for someone that says like, yeah, this isn't a good time for us to get into uh, us to buy insurance, right? Um, if that makes sense. Keegan says the most important is to trust the process. Yeah. Yeah, so, so once again, right? Like some of these, you're gonna frame these differently, but like the biggest thing is just understanding the real objection. Cool, you, you wanna think about it? What, what would you be thinking about? Oh, I'm not sure if it would work. So they will only right. So so Sydney, I guess, I guess what are some objections that you might get? And if, if anyone else is also like already in sales, just drop an objection that you might get and we can try to role play. And it's probably going to be easier next time because because I'll try to get someone on on the call. We'll, we'll probably rip another webby next next Sunday, but they need to talk to their spouse right here. Boom. Gotcha. That's not a problem. I mean, how does your wife, right, feel? So we tie this to benefits, right? So this is for life insurance, or Sydney, what 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 type of health insurance, right? Um, and let's say it's like a 50 Medicare, right? Medicare, um, like a hundred K policy, right? Gotcha. That's not a problem. How does your wife feel about you being protected, um, you know, in the case of an accident? So I'm not really sure how that relates directly to like Medicare, but I'll be like, gotcha. That's not a problem. How does your wife feel about you being protected in the case of an accident? Um, on your job site, right? I know you mentioned, I know you mentioned you need, or your, you know, I know you mentioned you're quiet on the job and it's pretty dangerous there, right? So this would probably be like two loops. So I'm like, gotcha, that's not a problem. I mean, how does your wife feel about you, you being protected in the case of an accident on your job site, like you mentioned to me? So whatever pain they're in, I just rip that. 
Gotcha. That's not a problem. How does your wife feel about you being protected in the case of an accident on your job site? Like you mentioned. So I know you mentioned you're, you've, you've been on the job for a long time. It's pretty dangerous there. Um, you know, what really happens if you do get into an accident? And then you're looking at uh you know 100k hospital bill what really happens then that's probably what i'd rip right health insurance 100k policy gotcha that's not a problem how's your wife feel about you being protected in the case of an accident on your job site like you mentioned cool i, I know you mentioned you're you've you're you've been on the job for a long time it's pretty dangerous there john i mean what really happens if you do get into an accident and then you're looking at a 100K hospital bill? What really happens then? So I think that's probably different, like slightly in terms of like Medicare. I, I forget, I, I honestly get Medicare and Medicaid mixed up. So I'm not sure if that's for like older folk, but, um, but yes, Sydney, does that help? Also, they need to see something in writing. Um, Okay, 65 plus. But like, does that help though? Like, it's more asking, like, does your spouse partner, are they supportive of the goal? So it's not, are they supportive of getting health insurance? Are they supportive of you being protected in XYZ scenario? So you guys have like money as backup here, right? And if they say yes, then you get the tie down. And then that's how we go into the sale. Right. Um, if they need to see something in writing, I think it's just clarifying what they need to see in writing. And then it's tying down that they genuinely feel that this is the best solution. So sometimes you would have to delay and that's a, another good thing. Like sometimes you won't be able to handle those objections there on the call. But in that case, it's more just tying down. Gotcha, John. I mean, you know, putting this in writing aside, do you feel that this is, you know, genuinely the best insurance plan for you guys moving forward. Okay, cool, John. And, and why is that? Can, can you remind me again why that is? Yes. So then you're getting multiple tie downs on that they feel that this is the best solution for them so that when they do, when you do send the contracts, then they're still like staying accountable to that and you have a higher likelihood of securing the sale, right? So that's different. Um, I, I haven't, I don't really know much about Medicare and insurance, but um, I, I hope that makes sense. So maybe. was that helpful, everyone? I guess just, yeah, I mean, was that helpful? Any questions there?